All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning and welcome to another edition of the Stanford Health Policy Forum. My name is Keith Humphreys. I'm a professor of psychiatry here at the medical school, and I'm the chair of the advisory group on the forum. And I'm also doing double duty today as the moderator, as our regular interviewer, Paul Costello, is on vacation. What the forum does is convene several times a year to address uh, really important issues in health policy and health care, bringing in experts who can engage with the university community and the broader community in a dialogue that uh, is, should be stimulating and enjoyable. The issue we have today is an extremely important one. It's organ donation. And the math of it is simple and also scary. There's over 100,000 people at this moment who are waiting for an organ donation. But all the living and dead donors this year will only come to a fraction of that. And so the, the math works out to long waiting lists and, and tragically, people dying every day, about 18 people a day waiting for an organ. So everyone agrees this is a problem, but they do not agree what to do about the problem. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And we have three uh, you know, absolutely uh, brilliant national experts to guide us through this that I'm delighted to have here at Stanford. So let me introduce them to you. Starting on uh, your right is Professor David Magnus. David is the Thomas Raffin Chair in Medicine and Biomedical Ethics here at Stanford University. He also directs our Center on Biomedical Ethics. He's a prolific writer on ethics issue, including organ transplantation. Then uh, in the middle here is Mr. Tom Mohn. Tom is the CEO of One Legacy, which is the US's largest organ recovery agency. It serves more than 200 hospitals and 12 transplant centers and annually recovers over 1,300 organs. He is also a nationally recognized leader in organ testing and safety. And then on my immediate left is Dr. Sally Sattel. Sally is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, DC. She's also a practicing psychiatrist who got her medical training at Brown and Yale universities. She is the editor of the book, uh, When Altruism Isn't Enough, The Case for Compensating Kidney Donors. So welcome all of you to Stanford University. So I'd like to begin uh, starting with you, Sally. Uh, this is not some abstract public policy issue to you. You yourself, as you've written about, uh, received a kidney donation. Can you, can you give a, a sense of what is it like to be on a waiting list wondering whether or not an organ you need is going to come through? Well, <clears throat> that is uh, um, very <laughs> extremely difficult. And you're really put in a position, um, you're either facing years of dialysis which in major cities like DC, where I live, <coughs> is a minimum of a five-year wait, often eight and 10. In LA, for example, it's now t almost 10 years if you're just added to the list. And the average person won't survive that long. So basically, you're in the position of asking somebody to give you a body part. And um, so I was very lucky. Uh, you could say I'm a poster girl for altruism. Uh, a friend of mine didn't even, weren't even that close. She didn't even um, know I needed a kidney until she ran into a mutual friend and asked, how Sally? And the friend said, eh, not so hot. You know, she needs a kidney. And then this woman wrote me an email. In the subject line, it said, serious offer. I will not back out, <laughs> which is very important because a number of people did back out, mm -hmm. including, a, including someone I met on a website called Ma uh, Match, I was saying match.com, matchingdonors.com, <laughs> which I always say is kind of a J-date for people looking for organs. <laughs> and he backed, he stood me up. He, he backed out at the last, really at the, almost the last minute, left, left at the, not left at the altar, left at the OR. No, he backed out about um, a few weeks before. And, um, and thank goodness this other friend was there. So here I am, the poster girl for it. Um, there's a special place in heaven for Virginia Postrel, who was my, my donor. But um, as you said, uh, uh, well, 18 people every day die for lack of an organ. They couldn't survive the wait. About 14 of them are waiting for kidneys. So of the 122,000 people waiting for organs, the vast majority are waiting for kidneys. And dialysis has made that possible. Um, but, uh, you know, it, Keith said no, no PowerPoints. But if, if I did bring a PowerPoint, there would be one slide that showed the rate of organ donation for the last, or kidney donation for the last few years, and it's effectively flat, and the number of people waiting. And it's just going up and up. 
it's been 30 years since we passed the National Organ Transplant Act, <clears throat> which prohibits rewarding folks for giving a kidney, for, for saving someone's life. Um, interestingly, in 1984, when Al Gore, who spearheaded that law, introduced it, he said if, if, the, if voluntariness or, <clears throat> excuse me, is not sufficient, we should think about and move to an incentive system, or at least test it. And that's what I have been proposing. Testing a, testing a system of rewards. And the idea, very briefly, is that <clears throat> you would have individuals, just like we do now, there are about 100 so-called Good Samaritan donors every year. You know, these are people potentially like you who hear this conversation today and are so moved by the fact that so many folks are dying needlessly, just languishing and then rotting on dialysis, that you think, wow, if I could save someone's life, that would be amazing. So you go to Stanford University Hospital, you get tested for your, <clears throat> make sure you're biologically, <clears throat> pardon me, you're healthy, what your, um, your blood type is and tissue type, so they could find a donor for you. Uh, make sure you're well informed, the, all this. It takes, it takes a few weeks, and it should, because it's something and is very serious. You have to think about it a long time to decide whether you want to do it. But right now you do it, and your reward is that you <clears throat> it's like Virginia, you have a special place in heaven. It's an amazing thing to do. A hundred people a year do that. Why not, why not be able to reward people who are willing to do it? The reward would come. Let, let me ask it concretely, yeah. Sally. So do you mean like <clears throat> the, that the donor would reward the person or no. the government would reward? So how, yes, who, who would make the check? I was just, exactly, that's the key point is that the uh, reward would not be a check. That's the first thing that's very important. We're not talking about cash. We're talking about some sort of in-kind incentive or reward, like a contribution to a retirement account, tax credit, tuition voucher, even funds that, that could be directly sent to a charity. And it comes from a third party, so that the, the person, the sick person, doesn't have to reach into his or her pocket at all. This means that this opportunity is open to absolutely everyone who needs an organ. And uh, that would be either be the government, a state, or some sort of government approved charity. And as I said, it would be an in-kind reward, not cash. And the reason why it's not cash, and my libertarian friends always debate this with me, is because you want to build in as many protections as you can against people who are uh, desperate for cash, you know, rushing into uh, an operation that they're later going to regret. So you don't offer what desperate people want, which is immediate cash. You build in a waiting period of six months to a year. Of course, anyone could back out at any time. And you would give also follow-up um, uh, life insurance and health insurance, which is something donors don't even have now. Now, the ACA might change that. But, but nowadays, if a donor has no insurance, uh, there's really no obligation to him afterwards. Let me ask you one other uh, question about this, Sally. There's been a lot of focus in the media on the black market in organs, people in poor countries giving organs to people in, in wealthy countries. Is your idea that these incentives could go anywhere on Earth, or would they stay within people who were in the same country? Well, right now we're talking about just testing it on a modest scale in this country, uh, hoping to be a model for other, for other countries. Uh, but uh, right now, the emphasis is, is just testing it here. And uh, the point being, of course, that in addition to the public health crisis, as you say, there's this humanitarian crisis of a, of a corrupt black market. And the only way to starve that market is to facilitate a transparent and safe and ethical system of exchange so that people don't have to desperately haunt the back alleys and organ bazaars of you know, Egypt and, and Kazakhstan and all these quite awful, I mean, they're lovely places, I'm sure, but the black markets are not where you want to get an organ. So D David, I, I know from your writing you have real reservations about this as an ethicist. W what is it that troubles you about this proposal? So if you look at the history of organ procurement and organ transplantation, Almost, with, with two exceptions, every time we've drawn a line and said, here's the line of what we think is acceptable in practice, um, 
it has almost always been erased and moved so somewhere else. So for example, when you go back to the very beginning, Starzl and a lot of others were opposed to the idea of live donation because it violates a fundamental tenet of medical ethics, first, do no harm, um, right? And you've got health, healthy donors, you've got healthy donors who are undergoing what is in fact, although in the scheme of things the risks aren't huge, they are, there, are, there are risks to being a, a, a kidney donor. About three in 10,000 cases of mortality, some increase in risk of life long um, and stage renal disease. The risks aren't huge, but they are, they are not negligible either and, and, so, and for no immediate benefit to, to them. And of course, what's happened over time is we keep moving the line and moving the line and saying, well, it makes sense that you would benefit by helping a family member, so it's okay to do this for a close family member or relative, and then it became f close friends, and then it became just friends, and then it became acquaintances, and a decade ago, there was a complete opposition to matching donors.com and the idea of solicitation. Now that's become routinized and people are much more comfortable. So p because of the incessant drumbeat of need, there is a tendency to move, and maybe those moves are okay and appropriate, but it makes the slippery slope very, very, very steep. And so um, with proposals for what's called sometimes a seller's market, something where it's not individuals buying organs, but something that's very controlled and very limited in the way that's being suggested here, it, that may be something that, although we can go into more detail why there might be some concerns even there, that might not be very problematic. But the only two absolutes we've had where that, that tendency of going down the slope have, have not been able to cross has been uh, uh, the dead donor rule and the prohibition on payment because it's in, in the National Organ Transplant what, Act. What, explain what is the dead donor rule. The dead donor rule says uh, that you can't procure uh, organs that are necessary for sustaining life from people uh, while they're still alive. You have to wait until after they've passed away before you can take organs that are necessary to life. You can't essentially euthanize through procurement process. Both of those fundamental principles are currently under attack. And my big worry is that if we give up the protections in NOTA, um, for something that even on a limited basis seems somewhat reasonable and as a, as a first attempt, if there aren't enough organs produced in that way, which I believe there won't be, um, you will see that incessant drumbeat and you will see a shift from a seller's market to a buyer's market. Uh, and that's likely to have a lot of the problems that has existed in other countries, in the black market, all of the problems of inequality, uh, injustice, of people who are largely affluent getting organs from people who are largely not affluent, people who are poor, um, and, uh, and the harms that they have, not just from the risks of the procedure themselves, but there's a lot of uh, social science data that shows that there are other negative consequences to being a donor. For people who are donating to people they know, those are more than made up for by the good, good that it winds up producing. But when people turn from donors to being vendors, there's the social science data seems to indicate that it's gone poorly for the people either in the black market or the one regulated uh, country where it takes place, which is Iran, that the people who are vendors actually fare fairly poorly under those systems, have not done very well, and, are, and, and have all kinds of sequelae uh, as a result of being vendors. Do you think the United States, though, with stronger rule of law and also a, a trial, trial lawyer culture and all that, would do a better job than Iran? Uh, probably, uh, but but a, a lot of this is really unknown about what the outcomes are going to be. If you look at what the social scientists who look at all that data have said, is some of the problems that you see in these vendor systems are echoed faintly among donors, but made up for by their relationships with the recipients or by the tremendous. Uh, um, uh, um, altruism that they've got by coming forward in altruistic fashion. Even in those cases, there are still uh, um, uh, uh, ghosts of some of the kinds of concerns that have arisen in this other social science literature. So uh, when you sit, switch to a vendor system, especially if, as I've suggested, uh, a seller's market, uh, a very limited seller's market is probably not a stable um, equilibrium for the system to, to be at, re at rest in. If it winds up going to a, to a buyer's market, I think all of the kinds of problems that, that have been found in other places are almost certainly going to wind up resulting. Tom, you, you've worked in this field for many years. What, what, what is your take on this uh, proposal? Well, I think the, um, the, the payment for organs is sort of very akin to the presumed consent community. There's sort of two groups of people who, or people who look at the need for organs and recognize that the uh, supply has not kept up and is not predicted to keep up with the demand, and uh, look for what sometimes called magical thinking or silver bullets. And uh, one of them is presumed consent, where while well, we just mandate that everybody's organs uh, should be given at the time of their death, and uh, like they do in Europe, and look at the success they had. And um, it was three years ago I was here uh, signing a bill with Steve Jobs and Arnold Schwarzenegger, and I had the opportunity 
to tell both, to share with both of them that in fact the European programs that have presumed consent actually don't do as well as the United States does in actual transplants. And even more importantly, they don't actually rely on presumed consent because they still respect the rights of the individual, even though their law allows them to bypass that. They still always go with the rights, in fact, the rights of the family, even more than the individual. So, um, What does that mean, practically? The family says, I know that this is agreed, but we don't want it But done. we don't want to do it. They won't recover. So they don't really recover from anybody who doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, uh, where the family doesn't say yes. So they don't really rely upon it. But the more important message there, and it's probably the, somewhat the same message for the um, payment, is uh, right now in the deceased donor community, and I think we need to separate the discussion of payment for deceased donation from living donation as somewhat separate arguments and issues. In deceased donor community in the U.S., 75% of the people who can be donors at the time of their death actually do donate. And that's incredibly remarkable uh, sign of the value of altruism, the success of a charitable program. About 7% of people who can be blood donors actually donate blood, so you have a pretty clear gap there. So we have had some significant success, and, um, but it's very different than living donation. I think that we are a little, in the don organ donation community, a little concerned that if you uh, started paying for, living, for deceased donors, that you might dissuade some people who don't need the payment from choosing to donate. And uh, we don't have enough deceased donors to go around to begin with. Um, you can't rely upon uh, only the poor or the lower middle class to be your donors for uh, deceased donors. You need every deceased donor and uh, the next 25% as well. And, and I think there's a concern that it would actually shut some out. Uh, so altruism has seemed to have shown a value there. And the living side, um, the arguments are a little more nuanced, without a doubt. With roughly 5,000 living kidney donors each year, there's a lot more of us in America who could be living kidney donors. And uh, we certainly could uh, make sure everybody uh, gets a kidney transplant who needs one if we were uh, uh, maximize the number of living donors. Uh, so the, the opportunity there is, is much more real and much more tangible. I think, uh, uh, agreeing very much with David, the, um, if you look at the experience of markets, be they regulated or unregulated around the world, inevitably, the poor are the, become the organ farms for the rich. And even in places where it's more balanced, like Iran, where roughly 50% of the uh, or kidneys donated for living donors are transplanted to the poor, 84% of the donors are poor. So it's still, even there, they have that issue. Um, there's a, a big uh, externality of the transaction going on there that uh, uh, has a huge social cost. And much like Al Roth refers to the repugnancy of certain markets, that's a repugnant element for a lot of people. And I think there's a, definitely a concern in the donation community that that repugnance could have an impact on all donation. Well, illuminate one thing for me. I mean, in, in the areas of health I know about, usually being poor means you have worse health. So I would assume there's lots of people who need organs who are, in fact, poor. Is that not correct? That is, that is correct. Yeah. So it isn't just rich people. It, the, 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 some of these transfers would be to poor people. Well, yeah, yeah. in the Iran case, 50% of the, of the transplants do go to the poor, mm -hmm. but there's still 80 or 85% of the total donors. So there's a dis still disproportionate there. Certainly, if you look at other markets in the world, India, Pakistan, it's dramatically the other way, one way, one way street. It's also important to note that disproportionately poor people fail what sometimes referred to as the wallet biopsy test in deciding whether they're eligible to be recipients of organs. So if you're poor, you have very poor so social support, you're much less likely to be uh, eligible to be a, a transplant organ recipient. The number of people who are on dialysis is much greater than the number of people who are on the transplant list. There's over a quarter of a million people in the U.S. who are on dialysis. So there's lots and lots of people who are on dialysis and might, uh, might be eligible for a, might need a, or benefit from a kidney transplant were it not for the fact that they're at high risk because of their psychosocial situation. For them anyway. So uh, in some sense, yeah, I've, I, it breaks my heart that there are all these people on dialysis. A lot of them, I, I would almost say, victims of the clinicians who run those centers uh, who don't inform them when they're the primary doctor, don't even inform them of that option or maybe do it in the most superficial way that people don't know this is a reality and this is how you approach your family members and friends and churches. But then the other part of me thinks, well, if they did, there would be a new you know, influx of people that we couldn't accommodate, which is why, again, we need to try a new system. We're talking, you asked a lot of questions. I, uh, a lot of them were uh, you know, very reasonable. So when you have these questions, we're all academics and we're all policy folks, the next step is to try to answer them through testing. Um, I happen to think, for example, this is a question I'd ask, um, 
who's getting the organs? Uh, well, not who's getting them. We know that mostly poor people are going to get them because wealthier people are more likely to have relatives who do it, are more likely to, frankly, pay people, are more likely to participate in the black market. The rich people take care of themselves. It's the poor folks who are, are largely stuck on that list. So even if it were true that low-income people were more often the donors, it's a poor-to-poor -poor transfer. And I often feel that you know, so what if people are low income? As long as folks can make a decision in their own best interest, you really want to guarantee four criteria. Um, you want to make sure that the donor, whoever he is, and I personally think a lot of them will be students who at the moment don't have, may not have that much wealth, but will have high earning potential. You want to make sure that the donor is um, protected, his health, his or her health is protected, just as it is now, and even more, because I mentioned we could have follow-up health insurance and life insurance for these folks, that they are um, well-informed, of course, that's, that's key, just as we do now, that there's gratitude expressed, and that the reward is ample. I mean, you hear the word exploitation. There are some words that I haven't heard yet, thankfully. But you hear the words exploitation and commodification thrown around. And, and I found that in debates, and I haven't heard that here, but those are words that just meant to shut down the debate. You know, well, what's exploitation? Exploitation means you haven't rewarded someone enough. You've maybe given them a dollar. You're offering them a dollar. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, that's where you get undue inducement. Uh, so you have to reward people amply. What's the right amount? No one really knows. That's, that's another thing to test. But, but the amounts that people, that are generally in the literature, are between 40 and 50,000. Um, uh, Richard Epps, who's the, uh, Posner? Who, I'm, I'm blocking on the, uh, Epp, Becker. Um, Gary Becker has estimated 15,000. I, I don't know where, frankly, I can't do his math. I think that's way too low. But uh, ultimately, study inflation. <laughs> but ultimately, that is an empirical question. Yet another one to add to uh, is a, the kind of pilot investigations that I think are ethically imperative. In the current state of the federal law, if I understand it, is you, a state cannot experiment in this domain. Is that correct? That's, that's like right. California wanted to do a trial program where we, we took money from the taxpayer with all these protections and, and some amount of money. Well, we thought I, it, was, it would still be illegal under federal law. Is that right? Yeah. Technically, yes. I, I actually argue, and I have a law review paper coming out on this, that is, that is not what NOTA meant. NOTA, really, when you look through all the transcripts of the hearings and the reports and the discussion at that time. It was basically a response to a free market kind of thing, a bargaining situation where cash was involved, where wealthy, well, well where people who had the means were purchasing. Um, and, and absolutely in-kind um, exchange monitored by a third party, arguably, and granted, I'm arguing hard, but <laughs> arguably, the, the bill is largely silent on that. Pennsylvania did pass a law, were you about to say that, in 95, that allowed um, funeral benefits, but the, sca the state got cold feet and uh, didn't implement it. There may be another loophole, which is um, the, I, I believe NOTA doesn't prohibit payment for uh, organ procurement for research purposes as opposed to for, um, uh, for clinical purposes. And so if, if it's just done on a research basis under an IRB approved protocol to test the hypothesis about what happens under certain circumstances, it is at least possible, and probably got lawyers in the room who can speak to this better than I, than I can, it's possible that that might not fall under NOTA because you'd be paying them not for, not for being a donor, you'd be paying them for being a research participant who's undergoing a lot of things that they're exposed to by being a, um, uh, anyway, the, but, but again, if the, the, but I, 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 the reason why I think that's a better way of going about it is I, I don't want to see NOTA altered for exactly the reasons I, I said, because if you change NOTA and say, okay, we're going to drop that, and then we're going to do a trial, you do the trial, and it turns out, well, doing this in kind, not paying them directly, and, and doing it through a third party payment really doesn't increase the numbers very much. Uh, then what's, what's next? And if you look at the history of what's happened with procurement, there's going to be a very, you know, the need is so voracious, and, I, and it is, because the, the graph that you talked about, it is horrifically problematic. Um, the question is, what do we do when 
faced with this horrific situation? And the answer seems to be, in almost every case, we just keep going further and further and further because of, to meet that need. Right. Well, that, that need has some ethical weight, doesn't it? it? Does. I mean, we talked a lot about the risk to the donors, but 18 people a day dying. I mean, if, they, if, if people on waiting lists were sitting here, it, it would be very apparent to us that their lives have some ethical worth, right? So what, what, what does one say to them about why we, we, we can't do this? Yeah. How would you explain that to them? And we and should families? also not underestimate the poor quality of life that people who are on dialysis wind up often having, because it's as much as it's, it's not really just about death. Um, it's also about what the, and, and people often misunderstand how much of it's really about the, the quality of life and what really happens to the people who are on dialysis. You know, it's probably worth uh, adding this in. Um, Donate Life America has just recently adopted the, uh, an expansion of that definition of the 18 people a day dying because there are another 12 a day that are removed from the list because they're too ill for transplant. So I think the contemporary, the newest count is really 30 people a day who will, who will ultimately die from not getting a transplant. So it is the, a very poignant and significant uh, ethical and medical dilemma on the other side of the occasion. I think there, there is a, uh, there's a potential middle ground that gets past some of the legal issues in every discussion that, uh, that I've been at, in, whether it's with UNOS or the Association of Organ Procurement Organizations, discussion with Sally, UNOS and United Network for Organ Sharing, um, that does the allocation of, uh, of uh, deceased donor organs and has, now has new authorities and responsibilities for working to promote and, and, and manage living donation. Um, and, the, and that's around the focus, and Sally and I have talked about this, of the removal of disincentives. Um, some of these are pretty straightforward. Um, they are, there are real substantial expenses to, um, to uh, living donation. Obviously, the, the recovery surgery, where the, the donor is in an OR having a surgical procedure. And in most cases, that's been pretty well worked out that the recipient's insurance company or, or pays for that as they would pay for an organ recovery procedure otherwise. But there are numerous other costs, whether it's travel time, family having to go from, from out of state to be with you, caretaking, um, lost wages. And that's a broad range because people earn widely different amounts of money. So figuring out what that is is a, is a challenge. But it's, it's a very real and tangible uh, expense to people. And then there are some people who have argued, I think uh, a group uh, published a paper in 2006, uh, a fairly bipartisan group on this topic, saying that there also ought to be some compensation for pain and suffering. Um, pain and suffering, if you talk to an, uh, an attorney, a liability attorney, says it ought to be hundreds of thousands of dollars. There's others who say it ought to be something nominal because a living donor does have a psychic income from this donation. They have a sense of, of uh, fulfillment that comes with it. So there's some debate around these numbers, but if you add them up, you can pretty quickly come up with a number that's somewhere, depending on who's added them up, between ten and forty thousand um, dollars. And there's some math and some science to be applied to this, and there's probably some personal circumstances to be applied. But there are ways to do that, and that would not be, if you can show there are four specific activities related to that, that uh, living donation, would, would not be in, the, in, con in conflict with NOTA uh, per most of the, uh, my professional colleagues. You, you, I mean, you work on the side of, of getting people to donate. So could you illuminate why do people donate? And do they think about those costs, for example, that you just, you just described? Yeah. Um, on the deceased donation side, it's a, uh, it's a much more, it's a much clearer, much, the clarity is around the decision is very, very sharp. Um, someone has lost someone, usually shockingly, suddenly. Um, they have a, a, a sense of a lack of fulfillment and the opportunity to help another without a doubt is a help fulfillment of that life and, a, and a creating a legacy. And it's incredibly meaningful to families. And my personal greatest shock when I joined this field nearly 15 years ago was the mother who came up to me and wrapped, and I was ready to offer condolences, and before I could get the words out, she thanked me for helping her little boy make something good from his life. That's why people donate for deceased donation. Certainly there's a piece of that that's true for living donors. More often than not, it's for their little kid, or their uh, husband, or their wife. Um, and then there are those wonderful occasions when it's just for somebody out there who needs an altruistic donor. And there, those reasons are probably more complex and need some of the uh, psychoanalytic skills that the two of you might offer um, that, that I'm going to make up. But uh, their reasons are very much there is a sense of fulfillment and giving back to the world, a communitarian uh, approach to, to quote Etzioni. And so let me, let me ask you, Sally, are you worried at all that if we started to pay that that would go no, away? No, just for that very reason. I was just going to say that. You have given all the reasons why that won't go away. You mean someone who feels this is what's going to give meaning to my 
the, the shocking and needless death of my young kid, and, and is so glad that other people, up to seven, I think, people might be able to live because of it, are going to say, well, but wait, someone in New Jersey is getting a tax credit for his organ, so forget it? I don't think so. Plus, even if there were such a person, um, you would think, well, and this is an empirical question, but I would predict the answer would be an n of greater than one. How many people would find these incentives uh, inviting and would compensate several times for these people who back out? I mean, one thing that's so important is everything that we have, that we reward people for in this society, that it comes to body parts, we have enough of. We don't pay people for blood, even though we could, but we don't. And we did. And we yeah, saw, we did. And we, we saw did. the consequences of that. Yeah, what Titmus's work, which is very problematic. But um, in any case, uh, and now we have test, you know, much greater testing uh, capacities, of course. But and, and you're, you're just to fill that in, that we, but, well, but one, of the, was, one of the challenges of that, that came out and uh, yeah. really helped stim overstimulate the AIDS crisis was the uh, uh, regular paying uh, for blood from donors for blood. And, and it was in a day when they weren't testing for this, obviously, they weren't quite capable of testing it. But there, but there was a recognition that the payment was stimulating a donation uh, of blood from a class of people who probably would not do well on a well-screened medical social history. And then they switched the clinics yeah, to the better neighborhoods, and that did well. And then one of the biggest crises of infections was in France where they didn't, didn't pay at all. So, uh, but the point is, right now, we've got a lot of, you know, we don't pay because it's just, now it's tradition, but we don't pay. Uh, the Red Cross doesn't pay. And we have blood shortages. We pay for blood plasma, uh, which is extracted from, from blood donations. It takes a little longer. Uh, we are the world's greatest exporter of plasma. Not only do we not have shortage, we're exporting it across the world. Uh, we actually, medical schools pay for cadavers. Um, <clears throat> there's surrogacy, of course, and eggs and sperm, and we have enough of those. Um, you know, the point is when you reward people for doing things, you get more of them. And you don't necessarily displace altruism, although, frankly, I don't know that that's really the issue. As long as someone knows what they're getting into, they feel it's in their own best interest, they're protected, and, and this sort of thing. Um, but I always, it's my vision, and again, an experiment is what we need to see if, if, I'm, if I'm right, that this kind of um, giving a kidney, which is a big deal, I'm not trying to, to minimize it, for some sort of reward, some sort of enrichment, would, would play out along the lines of the way surrogate mother, surrogacy does. Not, no, I, think we, I think we have um, a national experiment, surrogacy. experiment just about to get underway here with the, uh, the circuit court that allowed for the payment for bone marrow uh, donation in this one particular area where they said if it is done through an aspiration method, which does not involve surgery, it's not done the traditional way, it's not as potentially risky to the individual, it's more akin to taking blood, it's essentially replaceable. Will the payment for bone marrow donation, if that plays out and is not circumvented by the courts, will that increase bone marrow donation in that community? I think it'll be a very interesting trial. HHS is yeah. against that now. But I also do think there's some important disanalogies. So um, you know, being a bone marrow donor, especially when you're getting it from the peripheral supply, is very, very low risk. And so I think that it doesn't raise those ethical challenges, right? So in contrast, you know, Montefiore a couple years ago shut down their, uh, their donor program when they lost a kidney transplant. And that, that's, ha that's happened around the country where, where thinking, we know that there are risks at a different level for being a, ki a kidney donor. That doesn't mean it's, it's in the scheme of things hugely risky because it's, you know, three in 10,000 is not a very big high mortality, but it's not benign. Um, and I think that that really does create a fundamental disanalogy, and it, you're, you're really asking something quite substantial from, from people, and you're asking something from the medical profession to do things and expose people to risk. Now, that's reasonable if that's something that they really want to do, and it's something that they want to really, really help. But when you introduce the potential that they're doing it out of desperation because they need the money, um, all the things that come with a buyer's market is highly problematic. A controlled seller's market might be able to mitigate some of the harms and some of the negative negativity. But all the experience, Iran, which does have a regulated market, you look at all the interviews from the people from the donors and what do they say? We did it out of desperation, we've been stigmatized, we, uh, we, we don't trust the healthcare system, they don't, and 
a lot of our data that exists now about outcomes and it being relatively safe is largely on existing donors who are more affluent. What happens when we shift to a system where the donors are, are poorer, who are less likely to get follow-up even if it's paid for, um, uh, and, and so on? We don't really know completely what all those risks are. You know, there, there are situations, though. I mean, we have a military that is you know, fighting abroad right now where we for a salary, right? And the people go into that profession, they risk their, their, their very lives and serious injuries, and we accept that as ethical, and the military does draw disproportionately from people from lower economic background. How is this different? Uh, you have physicians uh, playing a key, key mediating role in there, and they have a different set of obligations for what they can do, so that there's a limit to how much uh, you can have people voluntarily harm themselves uh, and so we have to keep, keep that as one of the factors to take into, into account. I mean, you're right, though. There's justice issues for that as well. And the, but one of the things that's really a great credit to the current system and why I think it would be a huge mistake to have any kind of market in, um, in cadaveric organs. So if live donors is separate, but why it'd be a huge mistake, as was said earlier, the current altruistic system for cadaveric organs works pretty well. It's a, got, the conversion rates are very, very high, at least for brain, for brain dead donors. They're, they're much lower for uh, donation after circulatory death. But for brain dead donors, the conversion rates are very, very high in the current altruistic system. So I think it would be a huge mistake to try and fiddle with that, because you're only going to be able to get marginal benefits there. And, um, uh, uh, and it's an extremely fair one, which I think contributes to its success. We know that the distribution of organs, when somebody is on the list, is distributed completely by a fair, objective system. And I think that helps to reassure donors about the fairness. Whereas when you shift to a, any kind of buyer system, that will not be the case. But no one has been promoting a buyer system. That's a, the slippery slope is That's is a weak very argument. Steep. It's not a weak we're argument not, in an area where It's been where 30 can, years of doing nothing. We no. have to try something. Um, that slippery slope was avoided for 30 years. Uh, and that's correct. we take another, you have to take a next step and not be so scared of things that could happen in the future when we know immediately we have a chance of, we have a chance, I can't guarantee, but a chance of saving people's lives. As I said, the record in transplant has been that every time that it's been legal and possible, with the only two exceptions, we've gone right down the slope. People say, made these same arguments saying... People are dying all the time still. It's not very that's effective. That's right, but, that, but people are going to say the same thing. If you have a seller's market with a very limited I'm not talking about um, a seller's amount, market. No, What's no, your you're, solution? You're proposing a seller's market. I am not. I am pr proposing an exchange in which people are rewarded by a third party. That, that's what I mean by a seller's market, as opposed yeah. to having the buyers directly buying. Right. So, you take, so, yeah. uh, so you take, you're taking out the actual yeah. donor and the potential variation in the donor's income. But right. say, let's say the state did it, or a foundation did right. it, or, so, so that there is not the, the fact that if you right. know, I'm wealthy, I can, I can put more pressure on and, donors. And I'm than suggesting that if, that if we change the one core legal basis for not crossing that boundary, um, and we don't get enough organs in the way that you're proposing, which I suspect we won't, the, that it will be almost impossible to avoid the next shift towards a buyer's market. People will, why not have a free market? They're doing it. They're going overseas for it. It's already happening. Well, the, uh, the actual number of people who go overseas for transplants it's is relatively States, minuscule. Yeah, and the, and, the, and a half of those are people who are were from the countries they go to yeah, in the no, first place. So it is a, uh, it's an argument, but it's relatively specious in terms of really influencing behaviors in, in, on this. Most people stay where they can have follow-up care. And they stay close to home, whether that's in their interest or not. Some are able to list themselves in multiple places for a deceased donor organ, and, and everyone can do it legally, but that's expensive. And there's... Uh, it, there is a uh, probably some good discussion around that about the disequilibrium of where organs are available and demand is. The the West Coast has the uh, the, the lowest uh, death rates in the country overall, which means we have a dramatically lower organ donor potential here. About uh, as California it runs half of the state, uh, less than half of the rate of parts of the East Coast and the Southeast. Uh, on the other hand, the the demand for livers in particular and even kidneys is is disproportionately high here due to diseases of the Pacific Rim, which is an interesting dem demographic problem. How do you get to organs where they need to be for people is a challenge. Do you move people? Do you move the organs? Uh, Kaiser system has been uh, routinely listing their patients in, in, uh, in the Midwest and the Southeast to get them transplanted more quickly. 
Uh, we'll, I think we'll find more and more managed care firms do that to try and uh, equalize this. And, and, it, and it will be in their economic interest, which is probably one of the places where the market is making some sense, is let's make it possible to get pe people who need the organ sooner, get it sooner. Um, you can get a transplant too soon. You can get it when it's, it's safer to delay getting it uh, till you're a little sicker. Um, let's make sure the people who are the sickest are getting it and, and move them around. That won't increase the supply, but it will save some lives. We've already seen that with the SHARE 35 program that, uh, that went into effect this last year for, for livers, and I think you'll see it in other areas. You'll have re reduced deaths in the wait list, but it doesn't deal with the fact that the number of people, for kidneys in particular, thanks to the remarkable powers of dialysis, keeps the list growing every day. Mm -hmm. And it will grow high, dramatically higher as we, the rate of diabetes in this country uh, is, is accelerating and will lead to kidney failure. It can, it's going to become a worse problem. So we do need to do some things. I personally think that this removal of disincentives is a wonderful way to test the issue of our, uh, let's, let's look at the economic factors. And the numbers are not that far apart from what Sally's talking about in terms of let's make a we'll call it compensation through some regulated means. The dollars and cents may get us in the same place to test this, that. where you don't have to jump through, you don't have to push NOTA out the door and say, we're going to bypass the, uh, the, the laws of, of compensation, but we can get a sense of how much is money holding people back. Yeah. We know that surveys show that about 25% of live donors now say that they face serious economic adverse uh, uh, effects from being, from being a donor. So doing things to alleviate those sorts of things seems very reasonable and consistent with NOTA. So, so we actually have agreement on this, it sounds like. But do, it, who would pay that? Yeah, the state? Yeah, to, I would, there's a very good argument that insurance carriers who as more and more people are covered. If you're, and if you're on dialysis, at some point you're covered by Medicare. Um, after 30 months, the majority of people are covered by Medicare. Um, that the insurers would have it in their interest because the cost spread across the entire country, all patient population, the cost of uh, transplantation is $50,000 a year less than the cost of dialysis. It's in, it's in the financial interest of those insurers to pay for it. Most of all, Medicare, right? Because this uh, and Medicare carries the yeah, majority Medicare, of it. Isn't about seven percent of Medicare costs are in fact dialysis? Isn't that about right? right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, can, oh, can I ask um, <clears throat> Tom a question? So the average, I know that they vary, but the average expense of giving a do, uh, giving a kidney, which which is uh, under NOTA, it's perfectly legal for me to pay you if you come to Washington to give me a kidney. I can pay for that. I can pay for your lost wages. I can do all that, um, which is great. And the average cost is about seven thousand. Can you stipulate that? Something like that, right? For the, that, that for the, the average procedure? donor, yeah, that the average donor out of pocket, or, or let, I mean, my donor was a lot less, yeah, but in any case. Probably, that probably doesn't, that doesn't include their medical, the, that they might pay out of pocket, doesn't include their cost of the recovery surgery and a variety oh, no, of things well, around that. That's, the uh, it donor's the insurance, the recipient's insurance yeah. typically pays for that. Did that cover lost wages too? Uh, if you no, I'd have to pay for that out of my own pocket to help my you donor. Don't yeah. Travel and yeah, yeah. Repeat it. yeah. So, but, but I just want to establish a that it's legal, but that it's it's on average less than ten thousand dollars. So what Certainly basically less. you're talking about giving them thirty thousand dollars for going through the pain and suffering. If you have a if you have lost wages for let's just say a month, and what's the average compensation? You can and that obviously varies. You've got that pain and suffering is a is a uh, st remains a more problematic issue in the field is how do you that's figure out what it's model. worth and, that's and what the value model. is, but it, yeah, uh, the, uh, <laughs> there, are, there, are, there are those who very much support pain and suffering being included, others who say, ooh, that's a really slippery slope because yeah, that could get yeah, that's that's true. overwhelming. Well, I, but, to me, it functions yeah. the same way as what I'm proposing, I mean, If you look frankly. at the, the cost of, of recovering a deceased donor organ in the United States, it runs between about thirty-five and $40,000, a deceased donor kidney. Uh -huh. um, and that's what the transplant centers reimburse the recovery programs for the staff that are on 24 hours a day doing these recoveries. Um, if you, the, the various studies that have added this up have come up with numbers uh, in the range of twenty to forty thousand dollars. So, uh, who, by looking at the lost wages issues and, and the medical cost issues and, and the testing and the like, whether it would all go back to the individual is probably not. It would not all go back to the individual, but it would certainly a, a fair share of it would. Um, to expand that into a more formal trial would be uh, it'd be a good test to see how much the money matters. I'd love to see that. Well, and I note that again, and this is important to me, that would not be inconsistent with NOTA, which is important because that doesn't allow you that slide down the slope from if you don't get enough organs to go to a buyer's market, whereas abandoning NOTA potentially opens that door. That's very, uh, it's 
Great to see agreement. Maybe we've solved the problem in just 45 minutes. It's marvelous. Let me ask you one other thing. A distinguished member of our faculty, Al Roth, has done some work on matching. And, and could you could you explain like what that is, and is it likely to make a difference, or, or, or in your judgment, or not? That actually ties into altruism very well too, because what we've been doing increasingly is trying to get altruistic donors to tie into matching chains. And basically, I mean, one thing that would lead to a higher rate of live donation is if everybody was a biological match for everybody else, but they're not. Either for one reason or another, people can't be a donor necessarily to their loved one, but they might be able to be a donor for somebody else. And it started with paired exchanges where people made deals that say, I'll donate to you if you'll donate, to, if your spouse will donate to me or your, somebody in your family will donate. And it started with, with these sort of small, small uh, just paired exchange programs. And what's happened is the emergence of fairly structured institutional approaches to, towards developing chains where you get uh, so this person donates to this person, this person donates to this person, and so on. And the initiating donation is, uh, is often an altruistic donor that you need to make sort of these chains work. And, uh, uh, and doing it in this way, you can sometimes have a single altruistic donor turn into six, eight, 10, 12 kidneys. So, it's, so an altruistic donor coming forward right now, if you can get them into these uh, these donation chains, you can actually have, turn each of those altruistic donors into many, many, many organs. And, you know, there's a, been a really great secondary benefit. I mean, the, the classic case was the front page of the New York Times a couple of years ago where a fellow in uh, Riverside, California named Rick uh, Ruzamati donated his kidney as an altruistic donor. And it, I think it went to Cornell, if I remember correctly, and kidneys flew across the country. And we've learned a couple of things. One, they used to have to fly the surgeon and the kidney, and it cost fifty, sixty, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 to do this. Um, in our program in Southern California, working with UCLA, we started treating living donor kidneys much like we do live, deceased donor kidneys and shipping them in a box on a scheduled airline. And it scared everybody, but it turned out between GPS and all these things that we've had tremendous success and we've dramatically reduced the cost of living donation, which has been helpful to, to actually spur on these chains. Probably more importantly, though, some of the medical benefits have come out is you have these chains enable and these development of these pools have allowed much better matching, especially for patients who are highly sensitized. They've had a lot of blood transfusions, maybe a prior kidney transplant, and they are getting much better matches and much uh, apparently greater outcomes uh, in, in, uh, in terms of reduced re rejection. So the chains have a lot of potential, and, and uh, Al's work, uh, Al Roth's work in coming up with those algorithms and, and uh, as he works, as he tries to come up with these algorithms to, to deal with dysfunctional markets, as I think as he calls them, um, sort of creates a, a, an exchange basis that has been very, very beneficial. But once again, it's tied to the medical criteria. It's not tied to financial criteria, mm -hmm. even though we've seen some financial benefits from it. Right. Sally, what, what's your view of that? Is oh, that... I love, oh, it's wonderful. The chains are fantastic. As far as impact on the list, it's, it's, it's not uh, trivial, but it's not huge. Um, it's a few thousand, 5,000 maybe, which is, believe me, if you're one of those 5,000, it's everything or from their family. Uh, but of course, when I hear that, my first thought is, well, let's get more people to, to kick off those lists by making, you know, by enrich, offering them, offering to enrich them. And I, w I was cut off before when I was um, tr uh, trying to say that um, what I imagine the phenomena will be like, but again, testable. I mentioned surrogacy, but the reason I mentioned that was because, <clears throat> you know, if you talk to surrogate moms or read surveys of them or accounts, it, it, there's you know, astounding uniformity in how they view that opp opportunity. A, they see it as an opportunity. Uh, they have enormous compassion for, for women who couldn't have their own children. They say, well, it was easy for me, and if I can help someone, you know, a family fulfill their dream, I would love to. But I'm not doing it without, you know, getting my pain and suffering, in this case, um, you know, compensated. Uh, I do think that would be the spirit in which people do it. I don't, we can't know that. Um, but um, anyway, and I'd love to see that kind of person help those lists, those um, Tomino chains along. You know, we, uh, I mentioned early on the, uh, the, the bill signing that took place here with Steve Jobs and Arnold Schwarzenegger almost three years ago, and that was to sign in a bill called Living Donation California, which is the first in the nation program to uh, identify altruistic donors to start kidney, uh, living donor kidney chains. It also is, uh, serves as an information tool and identify if you want to donate to your family member, it can do that as well. And it's really been in its rollout year, just not publicized, just to see how it plays out. And I think we have 50 patients rolling through it right now. 
Um, but it is one of those areas where the question does come up, can I be paid for this? Can I be compensated? And obviously, the, uh, the website right now says, well, you can't, and here's why. And it cites the reasons, and it speaks to the altruistic uh, notions. It would be an interesting experiment to see if the language was changed to say, you, you can't be paid for the kidney you're providing, but you will, these costs will be covered, and here's how they will be covered. It would be very interesting to see if we get a, a higher number of people signing on for that. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Well, I'd like to close on a, a positive note. You, you're, you're all here on the, uh, for the World Transplant Congress, which I understand is the largest gathering ever of all the various organizations in this field. You'll be heading up to San Francisco after that later today. Do you see anything in that meeting or expect to see anything that's going to make you feel some optimism that we're going to go uh, forward on this issue? David, I'll start with you. Well, I'm not sure if it's this meeting that there's going to be optimism, but I mean, for for other than kidney, I think there is cause for optimism. The development of, uh, of breakthrough treatments that are right now currently prohibitively expensive for hepatitis C means that there's an expiration date on the sh shortage of livers. It may take a long time for that to happen, but it is now inevitable that eventually the liver shortages will become, that gap is going to become very close to being, being closed over, over time. Similarly, lots of developments in cardiac devices, LVAD, RVADs, and now total um, artificial heart replacements. You know, the development of uh, VADs as destination therapies rather than as just bridges to transplant has, is, I think, a game changer. I think it's inevitable that total artificial hearts will also eventually have a similar sort of trajectory and become a destination therapy when you get to the point where those start to become closer in performance to transplant. We will no longer have the acute, com acute problem uh, that we currently have for heart transplants. Kidneys is, are harder, and I think it's a much longer way out before we're going to have a tr uh, treatments from regenerative medicine or artificial kidneys to really solve that problem. And I don't know if, unlike uh, the liver transplant case where the underlying cause, is a, one of the major underlying causes being dramatically treated, I don't know if we're close to any kind of similar breakthroughs to the, to the myriad causes of, of, uh, of ki kidney failure. But at least in some of these areas, there's improvement. And even in the case of kidneys, I'm, uh, we're just, this, this development of these chains is still very much in its early stages and really going forward with altruism. Altruism was viewed with a lot of, of mistrust a decade ago by many, many transplant programs. So we can't be that surprised that we haven't had that many live altruistic donors when people were nervous about the very concept of it. And that's still somewhat true in, the, in, in some of the transplant centers. Um, so as that starts to be something that's more accepted and people start pushing towards these chains, I'm actually optimistic that we actually probably have a lot of room to have increased uh, um, draw, especially if we compensate compensate for the real expenses that they, they lose, which is not paying them, it's just making it possible for them to be donors, not vendors, um, uh, then I think, uh, I think that there's, a, there's room for a, a tremendous increase there, increase in these chains to, 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 to make up for some of the, some of the gap in, in uh, kidney transplantation. Thanks, David. Tom? Well, I, uh, I, I agree with everything David said about some of the improvements in technology in, uh, in, in, in organ replacement therapies, we'll call it. Um, I think there are some improvements in technologies in, in organ functioning, organ, man donor, organ management, and organ improvement. One of the areas that's getting a small amount of uh, conversation, not enough at this Congress, is the organ wastage. Uh, we have seen in the past five or six, seven years in the U.S. in particular, a growing conservatism in the acceptance of organs by transplant programs, and not for any good reason, not, for, not because they're seeing worse outcomes, but because they're being held to standards by insurance companies and Medicare and, that oversee them that were based upon uh, centers of excellence ideas that came out of orthopedics. They really were not based upon what's the, rel what's the relative risk of taking an organ, which may not be perfect but maybe certainly suit this 65-year-old person and give them 10 more years of life. If they have an 84% graft survival rate, no one will transplant that to them today because the standard is you need to be 92%. So we're bypassing the opportunity to, lose or to use organs, and we're losing them. We're discarding them, and we're not recovering some donors that we could today um, among deceased donors, and I suspect we're probably turning down some living donors for the same sort of reasons that you're not going to get these pristine results. Uh, we, we need to look very seriously, and there's beginnings of conversation of that at this meeting and, and follow-up meetings on what is the real mathematical and ethical and health uh, tipping point when you should be willing to accept an organ and say not every patient needs to get 25, 30, 40 years of life out of their organ. Some it can be shorter and we can save more lives by, by using more of the supply we already have. 
Fantastic. Sally, you have the last word. Okay. I think there's um, one panel uh, at the World Transplant Congress, I think it's Wednesday, um, with Ben Hippen and others about uh, Wednesday, the last day, which is about um, the idea of compensating donors. And uh, I certainly hope it's well attended. Uh, one thing I've noticed, I've been following this issue pretty closely since since 2006, which is which is when I got the kidney. That um, the folks in the profession, transplant surgeons and nephrologists, are gradually more and more of them are conceding something needs to be done and and cautiously thinking about testing incentives. But I frankly hope they can catch up with the public. The polls of the public are are uh, very inspiring. Uh, the vast majority of people are in favor of, of testing some sort of in-kind arrangement. And as I think the public is way out ahead of, frankly, the professionals who've been um, often very caught up with uh, you know, the pull of tradition and the risk of uh, risk aversion. Uh, and I understand that. In my profession, there's risk aversion as well. Uh, but um, one of the main things I'm hoping to do when I'm down there is talk to some people who are involved with patient groups because there's been no grassroots uh, effort here. I almost wish gay men or thinking of, eight, of HIV or white women and breast cancer were the ones who were disproportionately affected. Then we'd have this problem solved. Right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So we're going to move to the discussion uh, section. Uh, please raise your hand. We'll have a microphone brought to you. I, just as a, a, a reminder, the, these events are, are filmed and uh, played later on Stanford's YouTube channel. So if you grew up watching Perry Mason and always wanted to jump up in a room and confess to murder, this is not the place to do it. So please, not questions about specific personal patient uh, things, but about health policy. So uh, ma'am, right here in front. Oh, sorry. Sorry. We... oh, OK. Go ahead. All right. Sorry. Hi. Um, I've just spent the last six years of my life making a documentary film about an altruistic kidney donor. And I just have a couple points, which I found your panel fascinating. And I concur with a lot of the um, ideas. And I just got back from the Transplant Games of America. And to be in a venue like that where it's 2,000 to 3,000 organ donors, recipients, donor families, it just, to me, really just crystallized the urgency of this whole issue. In my case, the woman that I followed did want to be a um, non-directed. Uh, so the, the, the thing about matching donors, I mean, you did call it matched.com, <laughs> but you know, for her, it was really important initially to be able to choose her donor. And she went on and really, she knew she wanted to give it to a woman, someone in a helping profession and so on, very prescriptive. And yet the uh, hospital that they were working with, they could not disclose that they had met that way because the hospital at that time, which was in 08, was not entertaining that. So I think that's an issue. It ended up that they were not a match, so they did go into a pair situation, which also did not to come to fruition. Lost wages was a huge issue for my um, donor because uh, she was self-employed, and she had ended up having to go back to work after three weeks rather than six, even though she was not fully healed. And so I think that that's you know really something has to be dealt with. Um, and also, I was surprised none of you mentioned that the value of a living organ versus one from a deceased donor. They last, at least in the case of kidneys, I only know about kidneys, they last 50% longer. So they are, you know, more valuable in that way. They will last in a transplant recipient um, that much longer. So I think that's really important. And the one thing that I think is a great specter on the horizon is that Donate Life, um, which is a national organization that has a number of uh, statewide chapters for the first time is opening their eyes to the importance of encouraging living donation. Because up till now, I know four or five years ago, they were only about uh, deceased donation. And they're realizing that there's this huge untapped pool here. So I think the whole issue of compensation, lost wages, how, pain and suffering, however you want to describe it, it's out there. And I think, you know, to, for the medical community or the transplant community to ignore it is being a bit, you know, sort of ostrich-like. Um, and I just should say that finally my um, patient uh, ended up in the National Kidney Registry, which you mentioned. But she had to move to this place where she had to give up on the idea of it not mattering where her kidney went to. And she didn't start there. So that's something that I think has to factor in as well, people's choice or sense of choice over the destination of their organ. Thank you. We have a question here in the front. 
So how far in the future do you think it will be before we create these organs in uh, labs? I've, and I've heard uh, reference to 3D printing for organs. Well, I, I, can, um, I was quoting a little earlier an, an old quote, a 20-year-old quote that came from uh, Sir Roy Kahn, one of the early transplanters, talking about xenotransplantation from animals to humans. And he said, xenotransplantation, it's right around the corner. And it has been for 20 years. Yeah. That's now 40. Um, I think there's some degree of truth of that when it comes to printing organs, uh, especially talking about growing them out of cells and, and, and the like. Um, and, but, there, but it's making tremendous progress. But, and I think you have to recognize, that, however, if, even if we have a, cross the hurdle in five years, there will be 10 years to get through te testing in the FDA to show that it is not harmful. So. If, boy, if you said less than 15, you'd be probably um, taking a risk. First of all, great presentation. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, I'm proud that we're here in Stanford we're trying to talk about this. Most important is that this dialogue needs to happen. It needs to happen because it's here. I, I'm a transplant surgeon here at Stanford, and I tell you something. I, when you have to sign that certificate of your patient that dies while waiting on the list, it's not fun. Most importantly, you have to tell their family, we failed. And that's happening every day. The attrition rate in California is higher than across the country. Number, uh, I have a second point, is that the issue of money, transaction, transplantation, has been here since the beginning. And I think at some point, we need to be educated to take the curtains off and say, what's the financial situation of transplant? Money happens. Third point is that transplantation has to be charity, really caring for the donors. I think that as deceased donor, I do it quite often, and when a little person loses their son and gives donation, and say, you have saved eight lives, and you have saved these people, tissue, bone, dura, pericardium, everything has been donated at the same time one hour later, that family had to turn around and go to a funeral home and out of their pocket go and pay for that funeral expenses. There's something wrong in the system. Let's be honest. It's wrong. We should be something in that pain too because so many people benefit and is something that we need to be involved. Third issue is that we have not mentioned social and community responsibility. I, I have been a transplant surgeon for 26 years, and I always thought, oh, the old stuff that far, I'm helping other people out there. Guess what, three years ago, my father-in-law needed a kidney. Guess what happened when you have that? You want to know that everybody here in their heart can raise their hand and say, I'm registered in Donate Life California. Don't raise your hand, but think about that. We all need to take donation and transplantation as part of our community responsibility, because the next day may be us. Transplant is not going away. Hepatitis C, we may cure it. I don't know yet. But still, we have a growing wave of liver disease due to other things, fatty liver disease, other diseases. It's going to be here. Kidney continues to grow. We need to have the government involved because the same way how we treat vaccination, every family knows about vaccination, am I right? You cannot get listed unless you're vaccinated. The same importance should be done with organ donation. I'm working with the state of California in a pilot project right now that the same education that's put the guidelines for public health awareness for the state of California should involve organ donation, palliative care, and end-of-life decisions, all together to every single member of California members. And I want to be sure that out of this, when you live here, think it's our responsibility as a society to really participate in this because today is somebody else, but today, tomorrow, maybe you or our family. This is important. And most important, I want to say, this panel has done a wonderful job to put, but let's go that there are a lot of steps between one point and the other one that we can do better. We can be a compassionate society. We can start with little steps. How can we help that family cover the cost? How can we help them? The live donors, the disability is a big problem. Well, how can we get some funds to cover them X amount? Of? And I encourage you, all of us to th be thinking about this, that wherever we go, we're active members of this project. Hi.
Hi, uh, thank you. Those are great comments. Um, I'm David O. I'm a medical director at the um, Stanford Blood Center. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, I guess, a couple questions. One is, I think that most of us wouldn't have a, a strong objections to uh, appropriately compensating uh, donors, living donors, especially for their, you know, time and effort uh, to a certain extent. But I think the question then comes to what level can you, you know, that's the slippery slope we're talking about. So if you're talking about $100,000, $200,000, as the slippery slope kind of developing into that, you could easily start seeing the arguments um, for that and a much more robust uh, de uh, debate. Uh, I think the other uh, question I had was with the development of the chains, which I, th I think sounds like a good idea to me, um, would it be ethically appropriate to uh, to require or request people who get uh, kidneys uh, uh, as a donation to then have someone uh, donate a kidney on their behalf and start another chain. And uh, that way it would be not so much a monetary responsibility in terms of uh, compensation, but uh, uh, more of an obligation to give back. Interesting idea. What do you think of that? It's an interesting idea. Well, people have talked about trying to encourage that, but it's been impossible for a lot of reasons to make it a requirement. For one thing, some people have nobody in their family who's eligible. There's a significant health screen that you have to have, and if the people that they're close to or they're just not willing to. After all, sometimes even within families, all, there might be a relative who's in fact a match who can donate a kidney to them, but they don't. They choose not to because of all because of the risks and the other things that we've talked about. I also, from just a linguistic point of view, I think it's really important to, to have our language clear. So the difference between donors and vendors, and the distinction between compensation and um, reimbursement. So I think I think a system where you're reimbursing donors for the real expenses that they have to currently pay out of pocket is very different from a compensation system in which you turn them from donors into vendors. And I think the, 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 um, the, la the former is allowable under NOTA and it seems like that's a, that's a reasonable approach that we, that, and there's more that we can do to try and get more organs. The latter, as I've suggested, I believe opens the door to a problematic slippery soap toward a buyer's market. So you turn them from vendors to lifesavers, but. Uh... <laughs> the, uh, the, the comment about the change and that you have to uh, have someone else who gives them, that's inherent to the nature of a chain that you don't get into a chain unless you have somebody who wants to donate. So the altruistic donor gives to patient X, patient X's friend or spouse or loved one, gives to the next person in some other place uh, who has another person who can give, and they give on. And these chains continue on until there's no one that matches, and the last one is last or kidney is given back to the list uh, that the deceased donor list of people who are registered or just listed for, for deceased donor organ, which it's their lucky day whoever gets that one. So that's the way chains are supposed to work. Sometimes these chains break as the person who is supposed to pay it forward doesn't do so, uh, but they are inherently based upon that notion of of paying it forward, and you have to be part of that. But he's suggesting that everybody yeah. who receives a, a, a kidney would have to be in that system, which would be a radical change. Can I just say one more thing about about, about al altruism and relates back to the comment about the, uh, um, uh, the from the documentary filmmaker? Um, you know, uh, uh, as I've already indicated, historically there's been a, a history of ambivalence towards altruistic donation in, and, and towards matchingdonors.com. In 2008, you saw that, opposite, uh, um, that concern here at Stanford in 10 years ago, roughly, or eight or nine years ago, when uh, matchingdonors.com first happened in the Denver case, first, first use of it that became public, we said no to that. We had a, somebody who had a potential donor at Stanford, and we, we said the same thing. No, if you come, come through that, things have changed since then. And that's an example of something where we drew a line, and now we've moved the line for someone. But that also means, I mean, it, it is striking the contrast. And no doubt the risks are, uh, and, the, and the, the burden explains part of this difference, but not all of it. 75% conversion rate. We have an altruistic conversion rate of 75% for, uh, for cadaveric donors. Part of the lack of altruistic donors is a function of that ambivalence and the fact that there is this nervousness and opposition. As that gets lessened and there's, and there's more uh, of a support in the system for altruistic donation and for developing these kidney chains, I think we don't yet know really where, uh, we're talking about empirically, we don't really know as that culture shift, ha shift happens how far we're going to get in getting more organs from in that fashion. But I'm optimistic, cautiously optimistic that we're going to actually see significant growth in that area. Let's just take a couple more questions before we wrap up. Uh, you got there? Okay, go ahead. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Steve O'Connick from Trio, and I've had a liver uh, transplant now for 22 years, and God, have things changed. Um, the question, specific question I have is on the Iranian experience, and the only exposure I've had to that is the Fry Revere book that came out this year, and I'm wondering, are there any elements in the Iranian experience that you'd say, yeah, this works, we ought to consider it? Right. That's a, that's a book that's um, <clears throat> by a woman who went to um, Iran for three months and interviewed a lot of uh, transplant surgeons and donors um, in Iran. It's called the Kidney Cellars, and it's a it's a very it, it's a very interesting, almost anthropologic study um, <clears throat> and observations. And she found differences, a lot of regional differences, but uh, the most optimistic. Uh, uh, version of what she saw was that, again, it, it was, in fact, mostly students, young people who were donating, uh, and that Iran, she says, is a, is a country where the uh, actually the, the list to donate is longer than the list to receive. Uh, but there was variation in some places, um, some regions, the patients didn't, the donors felt they didn't get paid enough and they weren't adequately respected and that which is which is an interesting thing in a sense even if someone is paid they still want to it's not an exchange like a you know radio shack you still it's a it's a very human kind of transaction you expect to be reciprocated not only in in something that will enhance you but a gratitude for it um, and uh, but in others again as she as she found that um, uh, the people afterwards, she interviewed them. Granted, it wasn't the most scientific sample, but she tried to be random, and that most people said they would do it again. And, um, but the earlier studies from Iran, the ones you're, you're quoting, were all dis quite disastrous, it, um, it, it, that uh, the people weren't followed up properly, and they, um, <clears throat> and they had lots of you know, complaints. But I think Iran has also evolved on this issue. Um, so everyone is a little hesitant to, to hold Iran uh, up as a model, you know, understandably. But in this particular regard, they've, uh, I wouldn't do it the way they do it. We don't have to get into it. But it just shows the principle that when you do um, uh, reward people, they, they respond. And you can do it in such a way that, that uh, everyone's best interests are served. In, Iran has a, uh, one other factor, which is uh, parallel something we see in much of southern Europe, which is a relatively homogeneous religious community, uh, dramatically homogeneous. Um, you see the leading countries of Europe, where the donations, Spain, Portugal stand out, where they're 95% Catholic. There's a high association between ca predominantly Catholic countries and high donation rates. Um, in Iran, the, uh, there is a, in the last uh, year, there's a very, very strong uh, promotion of donation from the leading religious authorities um, in, the, in the country. And the areas where they have the best developed programs for deceased donor recovery are showing uh, donation rates uh, in the in, in authorization rates in the 90% range. Um, I'm actually going to be going there in October as part of a team to sort of train people to spread the, the technologies about how they're doing this, and I'll report back. Uh, but they, they do still have the ongoing issue that they do compensate the deceased donor families and they compensate living donors. And the, but it's a, it's a very closely, much more closely monitored and regulated system than anywhere else in the world. And uh, I, I think as they expand this, uh, the deceased donor program, we're going to see them create a, a greater regulation around this. And we may have something to learn. It may not be something we choose to do. But one thing we know, we will never be as homogeneous a country as they are. We will always have cultural differences that will weigh in. Sure, good point. OK, last question. There's a lady back there. It's a, so we'll give a new person a chance there. Yeah. My question's about the uh, reimbursement or compensation in the form of insurance that you were referring to. And I'm wondering what you're contemplating, uh, how long it would last, how it might work. I see that as something that could potentially be a very significant barrier, given the costs. Um, a significant barrier to you know, a person not donating if they didn't think their health to, would be followed, you mean? No, to a system that would allow that form of compensation, just the, the cost of well, insurance. Well, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, on the first, this whole, that whole thing might be moot because of the ACA. But, um, <clears throat> but one thing we didn't mention is that we keep talking about these in-kind rewards, and I, I again speculate it would be a value of forty to fifty thousand. Well, where is that coming from? It's certainly not coming from the the person who needs it. It's coming from a third party or the 
state or the federal government. So uh, if it's coming from the state or the feds, um, the Medicare savings would be tremendous from this. It costs about $80,000 a year to maintain someone on dialysis. No, 90. OK, no, 90. And um, frankly, there you go. Um, it costs 12,000 a year, 12 to 20, depending on the patient, to maintain. Well, that, actually, that's a patient cost. That's not even a, um, <clears throat> but if you're a patient then, the recipient, I, I meant, then you have to be on anti-rejection drugs for, forever. And those are a, a, not a modest cost, but it's still, if you're thinking of the whole system in, in general and the costs to it, uh, you might transplant an extra person who would cost Medicare more in that and the, the cost of their medication, even though that cuts off in three years, but that's a versus saving about eighty thousand dollars a year, uh, and potentially even going back to work. Although not, not that many people right now become taxpayers again after they get a transplant, because so many of them have other systemic illnesses like diabetes that render them disabled anyway. But their quality of life is enormously improved. Some will get back to work. And it's more than paid for by the savings in Medicare. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the one study that was published in 2006, Gaston, Danovich, and Madison et al., looked at uh, payment for guaranteed that you would be covered if you had any kidney-related problem within the year of your transplant, uh, a year of your donation, or any compl complications. And then that you would get, immediately get covered if you ha subsequently had um, a kidney disease. You would be covered for the kidney-related portions of it. Based upon the numbers that we know that of the infinitesimally small number of people who are truly harmed by this, the costs are, no are virtually nothing for that, that degree of coverage. If you got a full lifetime coverage for insurance, that's another story. But the, these plans are saying you're going to be covered if you have anything related to kidney failure. You would be covered. It's infinitesimally tiny compared to the savings. Well, that could people have thrown that out there. Yeah, yeah, that would be, in fact, I always sort of envision a menu of what people could you know, feel they need most. Life insurance, lifetime health could be one. But again, I keep saying the ACA may right. uh, make that mood. Yeah. Why don't we wrap it up here? I think you'll agree with me this was a tremendously interesting discussion. So thank you, all three of you. Very much. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University please visit us at med.stanford.edu.